going to show your screen. We don't see your screen yet. Oh, thank you. Okay. There we go. A Tale of Two Thetas. Oh, it sounds like a book. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, Niedermeyer, um, back in the 90s, uh, finally convinced with his people with his research that there were actually two alphas, a higher, faster frequency alpha and a lower frequency alpha. Uh, we'd been seeing it in the brain maps for years and had been telling people about it. And his, when his research came out, it wasn't that much after we were seeing it, but Nobody saw his research. Then finally, in uh, early 2000s, people were saying, oh, look, well, Niedermeyer says there's two. And they started looking, and pretty soon everybody agreed there's two alphas. Uh, what's been going on since 2002, 2003 is that the same thing has happened with theta, but most people have not been paying attention in our field to that fact, although I've been talking about it since 2004, 2005, when I was digging into this stuff. But it still hasn't really caught on in a sense. People really aren't really understanding this. Uh, you know, when you say two thetas, people think of good theta and bad theta. That's not the theta I'm talking about. Um, in fact, um, just like alpha come, the two alphas come from uh, different processes, the two thetas come from different processes in the brain. So, you know, let's talk about theta. It's a very complex subject. Theta has turned out to be way more uh, complex in terms of what it does in the brain than anybody previously imagined, especially in the field of neural feedback. It was just something you got rid of because kids with attention deficit had too much of it. But it, the story is way bigger now, and uh, you know you all know that theta is critical for um, connecting up with the cortex and generating um, your thinking, pro your thought processes. Um, so we'll talk about that later on too. I'm just going to start off kind of at the myth level because there's always tons of that in our field and so is the confusion. So if you don't get a lot of what I'm saying, um, don't feel like um, you should have gotten it because a lot of it's very confusing and complex and I'm just going to be presenting a lot of the information, some of it very cutting edge, some of it actually pretty old about theta just to give you a new perspective on the topic, but this will be posted up on the internet um, in a few days and you'll be able to review it several times if you like. The theta myths uh, are that um, attention problems are caused by too much theta. Like if you have too much theta, that therefore causes attention problems. A and that's too simplistic. I mean, it's okay to kind of think that way for convenience sake, but they're correlated. There's not a causal relationship. They're correlated. Something happens in the brain, you end up with a lot of theta, and it tends at the same time that uh, people have attentional issues. But as you know, the brain is a system and it's a very complex relationship that causes this. Uh, another one is that the theta to beta ratio is the best way to tell if there's too much bad theta because there was good theta and bad theta. You know, theta's okay, but if you have a lot of it, it's bad. You know, there are different theories about it. Uh, the theta-beta ratio is not the best way to tell if, if there's too much theta, bad theta, and too much of a problem with um, attention deficit, and we'll show you that in a minute. And then there's the other um, myth that theta should never be trained up. Uh, well, if you have low theta, if you don't train it up or get it up, you're going to have a lot of problems with memory and emotion possibly too. So let's look at this map. Here we have a map um, showing you power or magnitude, you know, roughly the same thing. And this person was diagnosed officially by a psychiatrist with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, so where's the theta here? Uh, where's the low beta here? I mean, not only do we not have high theta, we don't have a low beta. So we don't have any theta to beta issue. When we actually look at the raw morphology on this map, what we find um, is a lot of beta spindling. So it's not a theta issue, it's a beta issue, it's beta spindling. And it's one of the phenotypes Jay Gunkelman recognizes being associated with complaints of attention problems. And actually oppositional behavior problems too. So that's a 
that just blows that myth right out of the water. So if we're having problems and myths with this, let's kind of drill down a little deeper and see where's theta coming from? You know, what's it doing? So this will make your eyes cross, but this is um, uh, colon 2005. Uh, so it's pretty well established at this point. And what you're seeing here is the hippocampus up here, right? And the hypothalamus over here. And in the middle is this structure called the septum. And I've always said, and we frequently talk about research saying that the septal hippocampal oscillators are what cause theta. Well, this is showing why we say that. And uh, you can see that there's, um, you know, activating um, neurotransmitters, acetylcholine, and inhibiting neurotransmitters. And these, the activity of these um, networks, these little networks, uh, generate oscillators that produces theta. And there's a lot of arguments about, well, does the septum produce or initiate the oscillations? Is it the hippocampus that initiates? Because it takes two to play. Who's starting the dance? And then other people say, well, wait a second. Maybe it's the hypothalamus. So there's a lot of unresolved issues here that are going on. The septum is a relay between the hippocampus and the hypothalamus. Like the hippocampal formation, the septal area has been implicated in the control functions normally attributed to the hypothalamus, such as aggression, rage, and autonomic functions, and self-stimulation and drinking behavior. So um, as it turns out, theta drives the hypothalamus. The septum is driving the hypothalamus more than anybody realized. So a lot of these uh, attributes that the hypothalamus supposedly was in control of turns out to be a function of theta. Just like um, activation of 15 to 20 hertz in the cortex is related to theta. So as we look into it, theta is a very central rhythm and a very old one in the brain and is um, a, a part of our mammalian past. And uh, other animals lower on the um, echelon uh, that are mammals have a lot more theta than we do and it dominates their EEG uh, like alpha and beta dominates ours. The other thing is that um, uh, it links to what we call um, the supramammillary nucleus. That connects to the ascending reticular system. So this rhythm is connecting the endocrine system and the electrophysiological system. So it is central to communicating to the body and from the brain and from the body back to the brain. Uh, theta is critical for communicating uh, information to both the endocrine system and the electrophysiological system. Um, as it turns out, theta seems to have dual functions in this process, memory and emotion. And if you think about memory and how it relates to emotion, it makes sense that those two functions would have to be together because how you feel about what happens helps you determine how much you remember of it, how long you remember it, and how long it stays uh, available. So different component frequencies of theta enable the hippocampus to preferentially select and entrain different resonant loops at different neocortical loci. So uh, saying the hippocampus um, resonates with the cortex, the gray matter, uh, in an important way. Its correlated or phase-locked activity may then result in strengthening of synapses in the selected loop by Hebbian mechanism. And this becomes what we call learning memory. Uh, now, there's also theta-modulated processing in the hippocampus that may be integrated with theta activity in the frontal or the temporal lobes. So it's not just involved with the cortex in terms of learning, but it has a dual um, pathway, both to the frontal and the temporal regions of the neocortex um, between these uh, loops. So if we look at uh, what Kirk and McKay, um, who were focusing on this for years, uh, their, their conclusions in 2003 was that there's this three and four hertz, hertz pathway which today is being called the recurrent pathway, which is dominantly emotional, but not exclusively. 
Nothing ever seems to be exclusive in the brain. And then there's the 5 to hertz, 5 hertz and 7 hertz pathways, which is uh, more related to memory, but not exclusively. And so that's the ascending pathway. And they have um, two pictures here of the pathways, and you can study those uh, from the Internet if you want. Uh, you, I could spend an hour just on this topic right here. But, um, you know, pulling together different pieces of research, uh, the more recent ones are showing us um, recurrent theta, 3 to 4 hertz, tends to dominate P3, PZ, P4. And what area is that? That's the default mode network. And you've probably heard at this point that theta is strongest in the default mode network and key to its functioning and processing. And you can see the pathways right here. It goes right through uh, uh, the association cortex into the cingulate region. And um, it's um, recurrent and recursive. It keeps going through this process. This is where we get rumination from. Uh, this is where the default mode system keeps feeding back on its memories and emotions to process you know, ideas when you're thinking in your mind, I about things. But it's a very um, emotional related process. Um, uh, Kenyazov calls it implicit early stage emotional process. Then we have um, septal theta or the ascending system which is 5 to 7 hertz and that tends to get up more in the dorsal lateral and the midline and FZ and this is more related to acquisition of um, uh, in terms of directing the external attention system it helps to direct it towards um, Stimuli of interest, it works in conjunction with frontal delta, and it's related to working memory quite a bit. And so that's more a part of the central executive. So the uh, recurrent was more related to default mode system, and the uh, and more emotional, and then we have the ascending, which is more memory related and more related to the central executive. So we have this pathway and that pathway. The two stages, and Knyazev would call this the explicit late stage emotional process. So you notice he's noticing that there's an early stage which is very emotional and primitive, and a more later stage which is more cognitive. Um, the uh, middle temporal lobes are critical factors in what we call the salience network. And so I'm just showing you here from some of the research how the temporal lobe ties together the parietal and occipital cortex, the what and where pathways that we talked to about, the dorsal and lateral pathways, and um, links them to the hippocampus and the memory function. And those um, all converge uh, in the, through the insular and the ascending pathways, the insular cortex and the ascending pathways, and also uh, involves the vagal system. And this is supramammillary regulated. It's very interesting. So the theta is connecting the brain through these pathways with the body, with the endocrine system, and with the electrophysiology of the body. It's a two-way street. And this in turn uh, responds to shifts in symmetry. The front to back shifts are related to left and right shifts. The front and back shifts are um, much more driven by uh, default mode versus central executive, whereas left right is much more driven by um, positive and negative emotions. So these two play off of each other, which is why in the new mind training you have um, uh, activation versus symmetry. Activation is front to back, symmetry is left to right. And here's the subcortical pathways for the ascending systems. And you can see how involved they are. And if you're interested in this, I've done presentations on uh, the ascending system and asymmetry. And it links into what I'm talking about now. And you can see, if you look at the theta generators, how much of the brain they affect and, and interact with. You can see the, the amygdala, the striatum, the motor system, the uh, olfactory system interior ventral thalamic nucleus related more to frontal lobe processing um, and then um, the more um, the septum and the, and the areas that uh, are more limbic and emotional so it links all of these things together
When we get to the frontal system and we get away from that recurrent system, um, we have some research showing um, that frontal midline, 6 hertz, um, generates sinusoidal spindles in 1 to 10 second bursts, and that these, this insight in frontal midline set theta is involved in the detection of novelty, of conflict, or things that don't work, or an error detection system. Um, it's where a punishment, you feel negative if something bad happens, and when there's conflict, and when there's error. So the system is looking at emotional response to novelty and whether everything's uh, a good or a negative system. And that's the external attention system we're always talking about. Now that posterior system that's recurrent, uh, that tends to show up when people get drowsy. So if you're looking at people as they're getting drowsy, you'll see maybe alpha going down. Sometimes, some people, it tends to go up a little bit at first, and then it drops out. Um, and then the delta starts increasing, and then theta increases as well. So here we have a map of somebody starting to get drowsy. You can see the alpha starting to drop out, and the theta starting to increase. And then if you keep going, the alpha drops out significantly and the theta increases a lot. This is what happens in alpha-theta training. So when we're doing alpha-theta training, um, we're dropping back to that recur recurrent system that's driven by the default mode system. So you're shifting in and out of consciousness, but you're tending to focus it on the default mode system in alpha-theta training, which is one of the ways we integrate emotion and trauma is through that system. And of course, you've heard a lot about that recently. Um, another aspect of theta is, is not just emotion and memory, but also glycogen reduction. So theta increases uh, as, um, perfusion decreases. So we get reductions in oxygen or glucose. In other words, if somebody's not getting enough oxygen or they're not getting enough glucose, they're diet, type 1, type 2 diabetic and, and their blood sugar's dropping, you'll start to get more theta. So here's an example of the alphas dropping out as the theta increases and then delta starts to increase. And then stage 3 in glycogen reduction is you get delta and theta increasing. So uh, you can have theta as a consequence, um, not of just processing emotion and memory, but it can be um, an indication that you're getting reduced perfusion or reduced glucose or reduced oxygen uh, in the brain. The emotional reoccurrent theta is very interesting, um, and it has a relationship that's... Um, that stimulates the ascending system and gets people worrying and uh, uh, ruminating. Uh, so I'm just uh, showing you that uh, there's previous research going back um, quite a ways to the fact that emotional attention was recognized as being uh, related to 5 to 6 hertz theta. And then in the 90s, um, the frontal parietal uh, research showed that it's very hard for them to distinguish between uh, what was being reported by some researchers as um, uh, just frontal exclusive theta or theta um, relating to uh, the frontal midline. And uh, here's an example of this emotional theta. This was a, a pre-training screen of an emotional abuse case. This was a child who was in school, who was doing poorly, um, had a good family, good diet, Nobody could figure out why. We found out that there was an emotionally abusive teacher who was making this kid's life miserable, and he, he couldn't study, and he was being singled out. And uh, the other kids were starting to bully him because of the teacher's attitudes toward him, kind of reflective of modern political activity. And so um, after we found that out and got him out of the class, Notice this, this theta here in blue is at about 20 microvolts. You can see delta is quite high. It's not getting enough sleep. I mean, in, in the past, you, people just say, well, this is bad stuff. There's too much of it. Let's just train it down. But once we straightened out the emotional situation, look at what the theta did. This came in like a week after we were training for weeks. This is all we got. After we took him out of the classroom, that's what we got an actual normal range of activity. 
So his sleep improved, his emotional life improved. So when you see elevated theta, particularly in kids, uh, you know, they're calling it attention deficit, but here's an example of it maybe emotional abuse. Okay, and we saw in um, the original work, work with uh, Judy Lubar that when there was a problem in the family and emotions ran high, the kids' training in their clinic started to do terrible with theta suppression. This is about getting beyond just looking at the EEG and trying to understand what the physiological causes and social causes are behind it, rather than just blindly training things. You know, some people got a little off kilter because we introduced a, a new protocol into the system, whereas if you had very little um, delta eyes closed, but you opened your eyes on your map and you had a lot of delta, the map would say, train 2 to 12 down. Well, you know, after we looked at things for a couple of years, we realized, you know, we learned from running statistics and talking to everybody that that's a situation where somebody's not getting enough sleep. And just training delta down is not you know, with their eyes open, is not necessarily going to fix the sleep problem. So that's why we often encourage people, instead of doing that now, to do alpha-theta training. Now, there's other ways you could do SMR with eyes open, and we've talked about that uh, on other Lunch and Learns, and we could discuss it more, but I don't want to get too bogged down into it. But again, these things are all connected. Uh, one of the things that we talk about sometimes, too, is that the digital filters can be fooled by slowed alpha and give you what false theta, actually. So, you know, you might say, oh, look at this theta in power or magnitude here. This person has a lot of posterior theta. When if you go down to dominant frequency, you can see that the alpha has slowed way down. We don't really have much, often very much in the way of fast theta. That's not a typical thing you find. So, you know, what you're really seeing, if you actually look at the raw EEG, is alpha that's going as slow as seven cycles a second, and uh, it's being picked up by the digital filters, and it's looking like it's theta in magnitude, or, and it's not. So you can have a reduction in perfusion uh, that causes that. Uh, you can have a reduction in blood sugar, kids with blood sugar problems that cause that. You could have... Um, a thyroid or liver issues that cause that. So these are the underlying physiological things that can cause slow alpha that give you false theta. And you could be interpreting it incorrectly. You need to be careful about just making up simple rules about what theta means. Uh, here's an example of how um, problems in theta and alpha and beta correspond to um, uh, increases in communication in the in the cortex, here you notice the frontal temporal theta showing um, elevations, and look at the connectivity. It is compensating. Alpha, frontal and posterior, compensating. Beta, global, almost global compensation. So you can see that theta, just like alpha and beta, tends to increase in communication interhemispherically when there is abnormalities in the magnitude. This is the brain trying to increase communication to compensate for problems. Let's say that you, your blood sugar is dropping or um, that uh, you haven't had enough sleep or um, some other thing that's uh, not getting enough oxygen. You know, you're asthmatic. And what's going to happen is that when that uh, alpha slows and you get frontal theta, maybe you're reducing perfusion here, the brain is going to try to increase communication to offset those problems, trying to compensate for the loss of function. We talked about the fact that um, theta tells the cortex what to do in terms of beta. Well, it's not quite that simple. There's a feedback loop between the two. But when you go and focus on a salient stimulus in the external world and your central executive system starts to speed up and pulls you out of the default mode and you go out to look out, say, oh, what's happening over there? Um, uh, that theta will start to resonate uh, with gamma in the cortex and the gamma will stimulate 15 to 20 hertz beta, which is, uh, again, stimulating thinking.
or worrying or ruminating, all of those things. Uh, and uh, this came out of uh, Meehan and Bresler's um, meta-analysis as far back as 2012, which is in five years. Uh, that's a long time in research, but in terms of the street, most of this has never even hit the street. Most people don't even know much about this kind of stuff. Um, so we have cross-frequency coupling that involves theta frequencies interacting with di distant regions through phase coherence while coupling with gamma freeze frequencies to drive cortical activities in the 15 to 20 hertz range. And you can see here's, um, here's your gamma, right, and here's your theta, and they, uh, they nest. It, they're nested, and this is an example of how they nest together. And this nesting sequence, the phase release relationship, and of course we don't have time to go into it here. Again, I've discussed it in network-related um, presentations. This nested um, uh, uh, a gamma here is what stimulates cortical activity, you know, to get these um, metastable networks going, which represent you processing information. Let's talk about theta in the spectral distribution. In the frequency domain, if you look at, here's um, the eyes open on the left in A and eyes closed in B, and you can see that familiar bump up at 10 hertz in uh, alpha in, uh, when the eyes are closed. And notice it's dominating on the right, not just what I talk about. This shows up consistently in research on symmetry, but even people just looking, what's the distribution of the EEG? You can see alpha's highest on the right side with eyes closed. It's elevated. If we look at theta, theta is, um, here we got, they're looking at six hertz here. We can see that it's higher than alpha with eyes open and it tends frontal uh, and midline, tends to be highest with eyes open. But when you close your eyes, notice that the theta um, tends to be central, more balanced, and it tends to be more towards the posterior in this. And that's because the default mode network, when your eyes are closed, should have the highest theta. Uh, this was predicted by our, uh, our brain map algorithm. I was predicting that before anybody did any of this research because um, when we ran the algorithm, that's what it predicted. Uh, and uh, we weren't hearing from anybody else about that. And you know, that's one of the reasons that our a database system is different from others. It's based on an algorithm and not just on a statistical um, uh, descriptive processing. In terms of the spatial distribution of theta, um, more recent research, 2013, is telling us it's highest at PZ, again, default mode. Um, T3, T4, T5, T6, this is a classic default mode pattern. So there's your frontal midline theta, there's your posterior theta. These are the two theta networks. There's your ascending and there's your recurrent back here. Default mode and the ascending becomes critical in the central executive processing when the eyes open. The salience network in the middle temporal lobe switches back and forth between a more dominating frontal ascending system or more dominating posterior system. And that's related to the salience switch. Um, when we're in optimal twilight state, theta is dominating and alpha is um, low. So we're pretty much in a liminal state in the default mode system, integrating, processing there. And uh, this crossovers were noted in early alpha theta training and you know eventually evolved into major studies on using this unique feature of theta to help people integrate. Um, alpha synchronization and desynchronization, which we talk about in peak performance uh, all the time, is related to theta. Theta salience shifts move you uh, into the central executive and that reduces alpha activity, or into the more default mode, which produces more alpha activity. So you shift back and forth with this middle temporal activity uh, that's responding both to stimuli coming in and to, you know, in terms of uh, 
the perceptual processing, but also the body's response to the stimuli coming in. You know, and the discussion between the amygdala and the early emergency detecting system and the heart and the lungs and the rest of the body, you know, all of these have their own linked system connected with the vagal system and the whole body responds to input, you know, salient input. And it goes up the ascending system and it tells the, um, the septal hippocampal region, oh, you know, we've got something of interest. What do we do? What do we tell the endocrine and physiological system to do from this point on? Uh, so you see it's very complex. And we're just still learning about that in um, neuroimaging. And one of the emergent theories, which is, has strong basis in the electrophysiology, uh, is that um, psychopathology is very related to salience. And that uh, when the salience network's not working well, or if somebody's deeply stressed, they may uh, withdraw into the default mode system more and have trouble activating the central and frontal systems, central executive and the frontal regions, dorsolaterals. So this, this problem with, uh, uh, with processing is a characteristic of a lot of disorders. People are kind of stuck in their default mode network. And if you're not getting enough sleep, you're also going to have trouble activating your central executive. You're going to be stuck in your default mode network. So papers have been written saying, you know, maybe this is one of our best measures of, of a disorder is how flexibly can people shift from internal default mode network processing to external processing? And is there a balance between the two in both states? Or are people more extreme external and more extreme internal? It's a whole area of research which could be very promising. Uh, and again, this SN that's causing the shift here is related to theta and to stimulus detection. So let's jump over and talk a little bit about theta artifacts. Uh, theta can show up in maps, and it could be just artifact from eye blink. Um, also from body and head moving. And if you have a, a, an electrode that's cracked that you're using or defective, you could get theta as well. It's not real theta. So we have to keep an eye out for false theta from eye blinks and eye saccades. You have to watch people's eyes when you're mapping them and training them, and watch your raw EG to see if, if it's this kind of artifact theta. Again, there's a whole presentation on artifacts, and this goes, in, goes into more detail on that presentation up on the internet. Um, here's an artifact that we talk about in that presentation of this person's normal theta, and then an ear clip that keeps getting whacked by hair or a, a collar on a coat it might be winter time. They don't want to take their jacket off because they're, you know, the core temperature's low, even though they're in a comfortable room. And then they keep hitting their um, ear clip on the on the high coat um, uh, collar. So this is kind of false theta you get and delta when it's really down here. So there's. There was work done um, back in 2001 uh, when we were all looking at attention deficit and wondering why theta seemed to dominate in it. People weren't looking at low beta so much as they were looking at high theta. Um, confirmation bias there, you know. And this research showed that prefrontal blood flow dysregulation in um, children with attention deficit that weren't taking drugs uh, and they didn't have structural abnormalities. And what they found was, in fact, elevated theta often, especially frontally, often indicated reduced perfusion. So that goes back to the beginning of our discussion when I said, well, you know, theta could be a consequence of reduced glucose or reduced oxygen or both in terms of reduced perfusion. So when you look at a brain map and you see theta low, I mean high frontally, that could be very easily uh, a perfusion issue. Whereas if it's um, global, 
you know, it could be related to inflammation if delta's high. Uh, it could be related to um, degradation of uh, of the brain in the temporal regions, like in dementia. So elevated theta is not just a simple case. You have to look at, well, what else is high and what else is low? And we talk about that all the time. So the theta, the beta ratio mythology uh, is put to bed by the co-registration studies. Uh, beta, theta to beta ratio fails to take into account delta magnitude as well as theta and delta locations since it's taken only from CZ. There's a problem, you know. Um, theta is at different levels frontally and posteriorly and may be higher or lower for various different reasons. And also, if you're not accounting for delta being elevated, you're not going to get an accurate level of brain activation. Because if we look at blood flow and perfusion, theta is one good measure of it, but it's not enough by itself. So Rosa et al. in 2009, um, they tried to figure out what's the relationship between electrical activity and blood flow in the brain, and could you, could you make electrical activity a proxy measure of blood flow? And they found that, yes, indeed, you could. And that's one of the whole concepts behind our what we do at NewMind and with the database system and how we interpret the database system, which makes us uh, somewhat different from a lot of the way a lot of other people are looking at it. And we find it's much more accurate uh, when it comes to getting at the source of the problem. But then our perspective doesn't rely solely on neurofeedback. Our system says you have to take a biopsychosocial approach to resolving problems. In this piece of research with Rosa et al., you can see uh, they had to include delta to get a correlation that looked like that. So here's the bold signal, blood flow, activation, glycogen, and here's their heuristic, their EEG heuristic, the way they calculated it which is very complex and beyond the scope of what we're doing here. But basically, they're looking at both delta and theta and relating it to fast wave activity and looking at that ratio. And so you have to include delta to really get an accurate sense of perfusion maximally. All of this over the years has led us to the stages of oxidative stress perspective. I'm not going to go into too much detail. There's whole presentations on the internet. I've written papers. I've posted research on in my journal. I've done presentations at ISNR. Those are all out there and available. And I'm getting a lot of support from a lot of directions on this. But you can see the brain starts out um, pretty green and slowly gets red in the as it becomes overactive. And then over time, it starts to get um, pretty red in the low frequencies as it becomes underactive because it's exhausted itself by too much activity, what we call excitotoxicity. One of the things when you downtrain theta, you often get a systemic response. Uh, we often note that when we downtrain delta or theta, things the whole system gets lower and people go like, oh my God, we're overtraining. That was an old concept from the late 90s. Uh, it doesn't make any sense physiologically. It's um, somebody kind of pulled it out of a hat. Uh, they really weren't thinking through things physiologically. But then again, in fairness, we didn't have quite as much information back then. And really what we understand now is that um, when you're resolving um, inflammation, okay, um, the uh, uh, perfusion activity increases. So theta drops out um, when uh, the delta drops down, when the inflammation drops down. And what's happening is you're starting to see the real skyline, the real distribution of the person. This is a distribution that is driven, inflated by delta and theta issues, by lack of perfusion and too much inflammation. When we start to remove those factors through nutrition and counseling and exercise and neurofeedback, we start to see, oh, this person system's pretty exhausted. They actually, their native map is actually quite low. And if we keep training, this delta comes down, we'll probably even see this theta dropping to blue. Now, it doesn't stay this way. If you can get the 
perfusion increased and the inflammation down, you may have a lot lower than average power. But over time, you know, as you take care of your system, the power will globally come up across the board. But this doesn't happen you know, that often in just you know a few months. A lot of times this process can take a year or two. I mean, people don't get into this trouble in just a few months usually. <clears throat> so down training results here we're down training uh, power is decreasing again in this particular map it's a different one um, note that the change is in low frequency um, and we're getting a 35 percent change that's good the brain's responding well to neurofeedback very good reorganization unusually high normalization they're both at 50 50 usually reorganizations at 60 and normalizations at 40 so this is a good solid change that we would expect. Everything's going low, and now slowly everything will start to return to normal power, but in the right distribution. Um, when we train up, sometimes we get some interesting changes. Here, this person um, uh, had low delta, and what we found is when we trained the delta up, their sleep improved. Well, now there's research showing that if you train delta down, sleep gets worse. So you, you don't want to train delta down when it's already normal. Not a good idea because that'll make people sleep worse. And so, you know, we adjust our protocols in the system bit by bit as we learn this stuff. We're not just going to keep everything static. I know it kind of um, moves your cheese and rattles your cage a little bit. But um, think about the fact that what we're doing is actually gradually learning and improving the system so your clients do better. In this case, the the... Delta was trained up. You can see the post map shows a lot of extra green, great change. Notice that the alpha in the pre dropped down. This person's getting more sleep. Um, the beta's dropping down. They're less anxious. The theta's increasing. Why is frontal theta increasing? We don't always know the answer to all these questions. It's a very complex process. But what's very likely is this person could be having a brief period of intense emotional processing and having insights frontally. That is consistent with uh, seeing that what we've showed you in terms of frontal midline theta and insight and increased activity when people are having insight. So, I mean, that's a theoretical um, improvisation, but it's grounded in very good theory and clinical observation. And again, that brings us back to alpha-theta training. Theta will increase when we're having insight. It will also, and more frontally, it will tend to increase in the back when we're integrating. Both those pathways need to be worked. Uh, this client has theta already high, like a crossover, um, but it's not frontal. It's more in the back that is high, so that means... Uh, they may be drowsy. You notice that the delta is starting to go up. They may be not getting enough sleep. If this is eyes closed, there's a little bit of inflammation in the back. But um, we have a lot of excess activity in the emotional realm there in the back. This is like that kid that we showed you before was having problems with the teacher. Uh, something else that's shown up that's interesting recently uh, uh, training theta with photic stimulation. And uh, we've posted this, I think, on the internet. Uh, but what we're, they found is they actually uh, found improvements in memory by training uh, with theta uh, photic stimulation. This is a new hot topic in research and using MRI to research the benefits of theta for memory. As you imagine, with so many older people having problems with memory, increasing theta can enhance memory, especially if you have low theta. Uh, so stimulating people at uh, 5.5 hertz um, actually helped. Uh, this is 2016. The beneficial effects of stimulation theta range are not limited to cognitive processes. For example, low-frequency stimulation has been shown to be beneficial after an, ex an acute uh, spinal cord contusion where an 8 hertz stimulation uh, of the Ralph nucleus in 
improved motor coordination, sensory processing, increasing white matter integrity, and reducing astrocytosis. Uh, this is slow at alpha, actually, but um, it shows that lower frequencies, you know, close to the theta range, also have benefits physiologically. Kirk and McKay, who I started out this study, were the ones who were, uh, I mean, this presentation were the ones who first made notice of the fact that there seemed to be two thetas. And they went on to say, we further suggest that it's possible that non-invasive neocortical recording of theta EEG activity, what we do with QEG, from the scalp in humans may provide a window through which to gaze the integrity of the limbic theta-related processing. And it's from that insight that um, we started looking at the maps and places like O102, sequential processing, P3P4, short-term memory, F3F4, working memory, T3, T4, um, semantic memory. They're hubs. They're not they all work together. But if any hub is out, you have a problem. And if you're not getting enough theta input, then likely there's something wrong with your memory and emotion processing. So Kirk and McKay inspired us to um, interpret maps differently. Here's a classic attention deficit pattern. Notice again, frontal theta excessive. Is this a perfusion issue or an emotional processing issue? Well, you won't know unless you investigate, do a good clinical interview um, and look at all your data because that's what's required to make that distinction sometimes. Here's theta in Parkinson's and notice the reduced beta activity. This is inflammation, reduced perfusion and um, reduced resources for activation of the higher frequency beta. Um, you see dominant frequency alpha is slowed but theta is not red so we've got um, slowed alpha, that's elevated. We've got real theta, reduced perfusion, and real delta inflammation. And then here's theta and dementia. Notice that uh, delta and theta are dominating. This person was clearly diagnosed as having dementia by a neuropsychologist, and that's the map. Interestingly enough, their beta is not blue yet. So Everybody's a little different. The stages are a little different. People respond uh, to disorders in the same way differentially as they respond to medication or neurofeedback. This is what makes it so challenging to do this. But that should give you a good overview of uh, theta. Um, TBI damages stru structures in the temporal lobes. We have problems uh, with hippocampal response to septal oscillations, so memory is dysregulated, phase timing is off, so we can't integrate with our thinking brain, and projection of cortical regions becomes disruptive. If we look at the computerized performance testing in, uh, with the new mind system, here's a good example of theta and delta being low in the posterior input to uh, sequential and, and uh, short-term memory uh, is reduced and what's showing up is uh, sequential memory is most affected. Again, people are differential in their responses. Um, here's sequential memory and excess theta. So not only is low theta a problem, but too much theta can be overwhelming. And again, sequential memory is a problem. You can see that uh, 0102 is disrupted there again for sequential memory. And then working memory, low theta frontally at F3, F4, and delta. Delta is critical to working memory, particularly in the frontal region. And notice that we have working memory is not working, and sequential memory is being affected as well. So there's O and O2 in the back. And we can see that uh, we, we should get some issues with short term. Uh, short term memory is a little low, but not that bad. So you see that the correlations line up when you start looking at all this stuff. Again, another working memory. And uh, uh, lastly, when we go to train, we can't always train uh, in the area that anatomically makes the most sense. So if I have somebody who has a problem with word retrieval, and we know T3, T4 is the hub for word, word retrieval, uh, it won't always get you the results you want. In many cases, it didn't work for us. We trained at FP1, FP2, 
two, particularly FP1 in the left frontal region. And we went from a pretest of 35 percentile to a post-test of 85 percentile in two weeks, training the frontal area, because our problem was really in the frontal area more than the temporal region. And you can see the temporal region is out there. But again, if I train coherence here, it wouldn't have improved things as much as if I trained FP1, FP2. And lastly, we have what oxycotton or clonopin and clonopin combined can do. Notice we have um, elevated frontal beta from the clonopin and slowed alpha and reduced perfusion uh, from the oxycotton. This person's like asleep with her eyes open. So that's what, what that does. Okay, so I uh, got through it and um, uh, that's uh, going to be our presentation on the two thetas. I hope that helped give you some insight into the complexity and a lot of the ideas here.